Mechanisms are everywhere, in your car engine, in its windshield wipers, in many drafting tools and in the bones and muscles of your arms. They can convert linear to rotational movement and vice versa, generate mechanical advantage and trace complex trajectories. These mechanisms may seem complicated, and you may assume that complex physics simulations are needed in order to describe their behavior. In this video I want to demonstrate that this is not the case at all, in fact, we can use basic geometry, vector math and algebra to describe the movement of almost any mechanism we can imagine. But first, what is a mechanism? The word implies movement, and movement means a change in position over time. A mechanism has one or more variables that we can control to define its position. Other parameters such as the dimensions of their physical components are given to us, and it is our task to calculate the relative positions of the elements given a set of constraints. Any mechanism or machine has a given number of degrees of freedom. A degree of freedom is a parameter that is needed to determine the arrangement and position of the components in any machine. For example, a point on a plane has two degrees of freedom, that is, two numbers are required to fully define its position in space. It could be their x and y coordinates, or an angle and distance to the origin. In both cases, only two numbers are required. If we limit this point to a line on the plane, it loses one degree of freedom. Now, even though a point exists in 2D space, a single number can be used to locate the point, given a line. For two points, we have four degrees of freedom, but if we add a constraint that these two points must always be a constant distance apart, the number of degrees of freedom decreases to three. We now obtain a link, with an x and y coordinate for the pivot point and the angle for the link. If we fix the pivot point, the number of degrees of freedom becomes 1. And if the other point is also fixed, the number of degrees of freedom becomes 0. The mechanism can no longer move. In a mechanism, a degree of freedom is a parameter that we can control in order to generate the desired output. For example, we can control the angle of a hand crank, the speed of a motor, or the angle between the handles of a pair of pliers. Mechanisms are built by linking physical components with joints. In two dimensions, there are two main types of joints, revolute and prismatic joints. A revolute joint describes rotational movements. It can be a gear or a link fixed on a pivot point. We can also join two or more links with revolute joints. For example, a pair of gears are just two revolute joints, with the constraint that the angle of the one of the joints is defined by the other one, given a gear ratio. A prismatic joint describes linear movement, for example, a piston in a car engine or a sliding door. It also requires an axis of translation, and an origin point that lies on the axis that will be used to measure the distance between the joints. Now, let's construct an example mechanism incorporating these two types of joints. We begin with a link with a rebel joint that is driven, that is, driven by a motor that rotates at a constant speed. This will be the only degree of freedom of our mechanism. Now, we add a second link, also connected by a revolute joint. At this point, we have two degrees of freedom, so we still need to constrain it further. Then, we add a solid block, also attached with a revolute joint to the second link. Now we have three degrees of freedom. Finally, we add a prismatic joint to limit the movement of the block and the entire mechanism, and now it is fully defined. For any given angle of the first joint, we can calculate the position of every element. But how do we do this? We first need to stop seeing the links and joints as physical objects. Instead, we should think of them as geometric shapes, strapping them down to their most basic components. Revolute joints become points, and links become line segments with a given length. We start by drawing the positions of the elements we know, for example P1, the pivot point of the first link is always fixed, and P2 can be calculated with trigonometry. For P3, well, we know that it must lie on this line, since that is the same axis that our piston follows. It could be any point in the line, with the condition that the distance to P2 is L2, the length of the second link. In this case, the intersection between a line and a circle 
will provide us with the final point we need to define the mechanism. To calculate the intersection between a line and a circle, we need the following. The circle's center, C, the circle's radius, R, and two points that lie on the line, A and B. We can define any point in the line as A plus DT, where D equals B minus A. Now, finding the two intersection points means finding the two values of T that lie on the circle. For that, we can use the equation of the circle. If we substitute the line equation into the circle equation, we get the following. Solving for t, we get a quadratic equation with two possible solutions. The value of k tells us how many solutions there are. If the value is positive, there are two distinct solutions. If k is zero, the solutions become one and the same. And if k is negative, there are no intersection points, as the square root of a negative number yields a complex solution. The four-part linkage is one of the most common types of mechanisms. It is composed by an input or driver link, an output or driven link, and a copper link, connecting these two. The fourth link is assumed to be the ground or static link, and it is not always shown, as its position is always fixed. Calculating it is a trivial task. The ratio between the lengths of the links and their arrangement can produce three main types of movement. A double crank, where both the input and output links can fully rotate. A double rocker, where neither of them can fully rotate. And a crank rocker, where only the input link can fully rotate. In a double crank linkage, the shortest link is the fixed link. In a double rocker, the shortest link is the copper link. And finally, on a crank rocker linkage, the shortest link is the input link. The coupler is the most interesting link in any mechanism, since it exhibits complex movement, a combination of both rotation and translation. In a forward linkage, its endpoints can only move in circular arcs and all the other points on or around the copper link exhibit intricate trajectories. Depending on the point we choose, and the configuration of the mechanism, we can generate and approximate straight lines, ellipses, number egg shapes, teardrops, and many more. Complexity increases as we add more links to our mechanism, but for now, we'll stick with the forward linkage. Don't be fooled, as it is so complex that in fact, an entire atlas has been published only for the formal linkage, illustrating different configurations of paralengths with their unique trajectories. For a forward linkage, how do we calculate the positions of all four links, given the angle of the input link? We already know the coordinates of P1 and P4, since these are the only points that define the ground link. We can calculate P2 using vector math or trigonometry. We don't know the position of P3, but we do know that it rotates around P4, keeping the same distance L3 away from it. Similarly, P3 is always the same distance away from P2, L2. So, what do we call the set of all points that are the same distance away from a given point? A circle. Thus, finding P3 requires finding the intersection between two circles. There are many ways of finding the intersection between two circles. We could solve this problem using trigonometry. But in this case, I want to show you a vector-based approach. Given two centers, C1 and C2, and the radii, R1 and R2, we start by defining a vector u going from C1 to C2, and a vector v perpendicular to u. Two values, s and t, will be used to locate the intersection points. Using the Pythagorean theorem applied to vectors and points, S and T can be calculated. To get the value of S, we can subtract the two equations that solve the rectangles formed between the circle centers and any of the intersection points. Then, we solve for T, using the value of S we obtained. Just like in the previous intersection problem, two solutions can exist, since we need to calculate the square root of T. 
If t is zero, it means the circles are tangent to each other, and there is only one solution. If t squared is positive, two solutions exist, as the circles intersect in two different points. And if t squared is negative, the circles do not intersect. Mechanisms have a few edge cases that we have to consider when modeling them. Consider this hinge. The two shorter links limit the movement of the longer ones. If we open it until it reaches its limit position, the mechanism will jam. Jamming occurs when two links are collinear. No matter how we move the input link, we cannot take the mechanism out of its jamming position. Now, let's analyze the geometry of the mechanism. At first, we see that it has two possible solutions, since the circles intersect in two distinct points. But, as we move the input link to its limit position, the circles become tangent to each other, and the number of solutions becomes one. If we want to move back the mechanism, which position should it take? The moment the circles stop being tangent, the number of solutions becomes two again, and we are forced to choose. In this example, I went with the top solution, but it could also have been the second one. In real life, getting out of a jamming position means moving the two collinear links in one direction or the other, forcing the mechanism to choose one of its two possible solutions. If we add a fifth part to our mechanism, we now have a problem. The angle of the first links is not enough to fully define the position of all the remaining links. We have an extra degree of freedom that we need to take care of. A way of solving this is to link the angles of the first and fourth links with, say, a pair of gears. With that, we can calculate the position of the remaining links using the method we already know. Now, we also have the gear ratio as another parameter that we can play with, opening the doors to even crazier trajectories. The inverse problem is also a very interesting one. Given an output link, is there a way to construct a mechanism that follows a given path? Well, for a formal linkage, there is one, and it is so simple and elegant that no equations are required to demonstrate it. We begin by driving the three positions we want our link to have. Why three? Well, since we know that P2 and P3 always move along circular arcs, and three points always line on a circumference, we can plot the circles that pass through them. To do this, we can use a ruler and compass to find their perpendicular bisectors. The intersection will be the exact center of the circle, and the locations of P1 and P4. Now that we have the centers, we know that the first and third link must move along the circle's path. We draw our mechanism, and there we have it. We are assured that it will pass through all the positions we specified. The study of the movement of machines is a very complex one. Even in two dimensions, a lot of analysis and calculations are required. However, the geometry and algebra lessons we learned at school are still very useful in analyzing these types of machines. Now, you should try and build something. Analyze how a mechanism you see or use every day works, or as a challenge, find an equation that describes the trajectory that a point follows in a mechanism.